Hi, my name is Simon, Simon Headley, known to my clients and partners as a strategic alchemist and an ultimate connector. I'm a chartered accountant who brings together and bridges the worlds of business philosophy, finance, marketing, optimization, ontology, and so much more. Always focused on one thing, the simple idea that can make the difference to people and projects so we can tip the scales in their favor and get them complete. Pause, Stop, Reset is all about the three little words that can make the difference. They have for me and my clients, and I hope they will for you too. During the show, you'll get to learn about my guests' real-life experiences and the insights and lessons they've learned as they've navigated the resets in their personal and business lives, which you'll be able to leverage yourself. So let's start the show. Hello, I'm Simon, Simon Headley, and welcome to this episode of Pause, Stop, Reset. Today, my guest is a long-standing friend and inspiration, the one and only Lee Richter. To be honest, I'm not sure how best to explain who Lee is. Yes, she's an ultimate connector and one of the smartest and really most heartfelt business minds you'll ever meet. She runs nine companies, invests in more than 30 of them, generating over $100 million in revenue. And she works with expert business leaders running multi-million dollar companies. But much more than that, she's an incredible human being. I think without further ado, Lee, welcome to the show. Why, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you. I know you've been running around the world. And so this is a a very short taste of Lee, and you can find more about her. We'll touch on how you can get later on the show. So for people that may not know you yet or haven't kept up with your resets, Lee, who are you and what are you focused on today? That's such a good question. I'll tell you, first of all, I am a mom and a wife and a friend. Um, My community is amazing. But my daughter, I just took to college. And I'll tell you, being a mom is my favorite thing to do. And other than that, in business, what I love doing is PR and marketing and creating things of value in the marketplace and, and building brands and launching them. So right now I'm in the NFT space and putting that uh, strategy in each one of my brands. And that's probably one of the things I've been talking about the most recently. Yeah. And you've been traveling a lot. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I, I was just looking at my schedule for the upcoming week and I'm, I'm actually flying to Los Angeles and then to Miami and then to Maui. And I just got back from Boston. And before that I was in you know Arizona um, and I absolutely love what I do. And I've learned you cannot build empires sitting on your couch. <laughs> Very true. In fact, I've been blown away about how when COVID stopped, you've been at like every mastermind I'd love to be at with friends and old old partners of mine. So it's been quite amazing watching you do what I used to do, but in a way that I can't right now here in the UK. So I love it. Um, yeah. and, and by the way, spe- <clears throat> speaking of the UK, you know, we have lots of friends there and I just want to say I'm sorry for, for everyone's loss and, you know, we feel it and, and we're connected and all of us feel the the tragic end of such a dynasty and such a, a reign of magnificence in so many ways. And, and you and I got to, you know, experience so much by watching a global leader and how to show up. And I appreciate that about you because you show up like an incredible global leader and always, you know, reliable and show up. And, and that's one thing I just want to say is really nice about you and your culture and the people I know from uh, where you are, uh, I always feel like that's a, a, a through line in the culture. I love that you brought that up. I was sort of keeping it anonymized in this call, but actually it's the 10th of September when recording this. Yesterday, we had our Fresh Flow event on the 9th of September, and we actually had it in a castle in Tunbridge. And I got the phone call Thursday evening that unfortunately Her Majesty had passed away. Friends of friends work with her, clients work with her. Uh, my mother had met her several times. And as you say, this is not a, a small impact. This person impacted the world massively. Uh, at 7.30, we had the phone call that said, the castle is closed, we're in remembrance, everything changes. And we literally had a poor sort reset last night. It was quite profound, I think, uh, being in that process. And we're still being with that. I think we will be. Um, so yeah, I really acknowledge that aspect. I think it makes it more timely because I also know one of your drivers isn't just, you know, make money and have fun. There is actually sort of this impact and legacy side. And thank you for sort of presencing that. And I think it's a sort of a reason to think about, you know, how we navigate and where to focus and prioritize. And I guess for you, Lee, if you look back on your life till now, what's been the biggest shifts and resets you've been through? Well, I, I actually, you know, there's all these milestones that were beautiful and I had a absolutely charmed life all the way through my thirties. And uh, my husband and I got married and we, everything was dreamlike. We went to Greece and Turkey and 
we had undergrad and grad school and veterinary school behind us, which was 10 years of college. And we were together through the whole thing and uh, not only survived, but thrived. Um, and just as we were getting ready to prepare to build our family, I was in a head on collision and a near fatal car crash. And it took me nearly a year to walk again. And um, in the initial first or second day after the, the car crash, um, while I was still in a coma and on a ventilator and in ICU, um, they were telling my husband I had a 7% chance to live. And so I fought so hard to get my life back, right? And um, after that year, looking back, I mean, what miracles both of us went through. He learned holistic medicine, which actually has helped his career tremendously. But I also learned really how to appreciate the heart and the soul in the people around me and myself as well. And through this near-death experience, all these other opportunities have arised because how focused I am on really living my best life and how every day is such a gift. And that's why even the passing of the queen, I take it personally because I know what a rite of passage it is, but I look at her and I look at her as a global leader. And I think, wow, the, the things that she had to be through in the public eye, both positive and negative, what was it like for her personally to you know, celebrate that moment or just be in that moment. And so she was a really big guide for me. And then I think about my biggest impact is how can I be that guide for others? Um, how do I take someone like that who's who's shown me ways to look at things that are in a positive, forward thinking light? How do I take that and multiply it in my world with my daughter, with my family, with my friends, with my community? And now, you know, through through these campaigns we're doing with NFTs, the reason I love it so much is because I see the opportunity for making the most meaningful communities ever. And that's what I'm seeing in my communities that have already turned into private DAOs, you know, with just a few hundred or few thousand people involved. What I see is it's so much more meaningful because we either have a topic or a group or an idea that we rally around and we move in the same direction together and we own the content and we own the IP and it's just such a different way of looking at things. And it comes back to connection. How do you create meaningful connections? And I think you and I are demonstrating it even through our own relationship, right? We have relationships through other contexts as well, like people we look up to, other global leaders. And what we're saying is, wow, I see you. I want to lift you just like you do in the world. And I love that you want to lift me just like I do for people in the world. This is why we love Lee. <laughs> so, uh, but one of the problems, Lee, I could do in the next two hours late like, responding to what you said and just thank you. Because one of the challenges, I think, especially here in the UK, there aren't many used. Does that make sense? And one of my biggest frustrations is both the show is going on a different tangent. It's a whole new show. Pull stop reset, brand new year. Enjoy. Um, usually Lee, it's very like these are the 10 questions we follow that. We're going off script, but hey, we can. We're enjoying it. It's easy. It's fun. We're having some flow. So one of the biggest challenges I see in the world talk about how women are weak. They can't build businesses. They're not strong people. And I sit there going, have you ever met a British woman? Like we've got a British queen. She's awesome. Sadly, that's changed today, but like it doesn't. We've had British queens for thousands of years. My mother is formidable. You're formidable, but not like in a scare. It's a different energy, right? And that is what the world needs. So part of the irony, and I love you sharing a bit about my background, but what I've been really passionate about is helping the right people go to the front. And one of the challenges often like with the queen passing, it's the impact on those people that who they've been for her will never, ever get acknowledged. I want to add something to that because I've been, been investigating this for years. Is that OK if I add a little bit? You are in charge of my universe. Go ahead. OK, so here. You know, I was in finance for 14 years first. I worked at Merrill Lynch. I worked in Wilmington, Delaware, which is a place where most, where a lot of companies, especially back then, were coming to be incorporated because of the banking laws that were very favorable for business owners. And so I read a lot of business plans. I met a lot of CEOs. I met a lot of leaders. And then I was promoted to Washington, D.C. And then in the Washington, D.C. office, there were 103 brokers and only three were women. And I was definitely outnumbered in a lot, a lot of my 
conversations or meetings or anything that we were doing, even demonstrations. And my name is actually Linda Lee. And I go by Lee because of that position, because it was more strategic for me to be Lee at the time I was Lee Taylor. It was before my husband and I got married. I was Lee Taylor. It was easier for me to be that because people would assume I was a man when they received my letter or some correspondence. And when they came in, they'd be surprised, but then we'd work together and then they'd see, wait, I have a better track record than most of the men in the, maybe all the men in the office at some times. I I had a better track record because of the way I paid attention to details and the way I do business, which is a heart-based business. And over time, my manager would pay me extra to set up the new brokers for success when they came in. Like, here's how to follow up. Here's how to um, use your right words to get um, a positive impact or leave a positive impact. And Those things happened over time. Like I was seen for my genius over time, but I had to stand up and kind of yell it from the rafters a little bit and knock them over the head and say like, wait a second, don't overlook this. This is important. But over time, I I made my own way and they trusted me. But the thing is, I've learned from Dan Sullivan since then that a big piece of what happens with women is they create their own glass ceiling in their own head. And they either say, I'm going to go through this or I'm not. I'm going to stand up for myself or I'm not. I'm going to have a voice or I'm not. But actions speak louder than words. And through our actions, we can create an opportunity for storytelling and sharing that. And we can create an opportunity for multiplying it. It's really up to us in our head to be determined to do it. So I don't let people stand in my way and tell me I can't do something. I just do it. I don't ask for permission. And that goes all the way back to my 20s at Merrill Lynch is I showed up differently than the other Lindas in the office. Did I show up the way I wanted to? Not always, but I showed up how to play in a sandbox and get ahead. They made the rules of the sandbox. I started by playing in the rules, but then I created my rules that were even better. And they started joining my rules. They started coming over and doing things I said, but I had to stick with it, be consistent and stand up for myself. You're right. But I think everyone has the opportunity to do it. They just choose whether they want to or not, whether they're so passionate about it or not. If they're so passionate about it, they're not going to let anybody shut them down. And I am in rooms with other CEOs and other women just like that. And yes, we do say we're few and far between, but we don't think we have to be. We think there's room for a lot of us. It's just up to women to stand up and make a difference and say, wait a second, We do have power of numbers. We can have, instead of the all boys club, let's have a girls club. We can do that. They just don't do it the same. And part of it is we're committed to families. Part of it is we let men lead us in our lives at home. There are situations where the women are like, I do what my husband says to do. That's their choice. That is their choice. A lot of times I'm seeing their daughters though, say, I'm not doing that. I'm picking my own choice right now. And I'm seeing at my daughter's school, She's at Northeastern in Boston, and I'm seeing like they have a voice. They've chosen to be there to make an impact. And I, I'm excited to watch this next generation not follow the rules like they've been in the past. And that's one of the things I'm excited about in Web3, because those communities, we make our own rules. We get to set it up the way we want. I'm in a thing called the Affiliate DAO. And it's Web3 and Web2 marketers coming together. And I'm seeing the negotiations and the conversations leading to, wait a second, we get to create this and share in the IP and the wealth together. And there's women in this group that are standing up for themselves in a bigger way than I've ever seen. And the way they're blossoming, I hope it creates a light for others to follow. So I think you and I have the opportunity to be on the sidelines right now and really watch women emerging at a different rate in Web3. And I'm welcoming them and hopefully I'm being a model for some of them to see, wait, I can do this too. And then that's really my dream is that equality happens across all lines and we really are all the same. And ironically, there's an NFT drop called We Are The Same, like we are the same, just to state that, like, wait a second, in this world, we get to all be equal and the same. No matter where you're from, no matter your equality, your economics, your religion, it doesn't matter. We can be in this in this journey together if we choose to. Thank you. Lee, would it be helpful for me to sort of take off my mask for a minute and be a bit real with you? Yeah. Yes. I've known you now for more than a decade, right? Yes. Okay. So a couple of things. You and I have had it's called extreme experiences in our life. I actually saw my father die when I was two. My mother caught polio when she was a very young girl and has a disabled paralyzed left leg. Those things most don't know about me. 
Uh, my Tai Chi teacher was Catherine Allen. She passed away stage four cancer. She threw me around like a rag ragdoll when I was like 16, already a front row prop at Tunbridge School. I'm aware, and I've done the maths and work with incredible women and billionaires around the world, there's a potential to have a, literally a billion female billionaires, and that's been the case for over 10 years now. That is now more easy to do when you get the world of NFT, and I'm also a banking guy. I didn't know that about me. I was PwC Chartered Accountant, Morgan Stanley, RBS, Abin Amro. I ran over 1.2 billion euros of ETFs across exchanges when I was an Abin Amro's investment manager, and I could carry on. That's real. Yeah, real, <laughs> real, real, right? <laughs> to do it right you had to write tickets and and negotiate and work with floors right so it's well it's, uh, was, so interesting i didn't that's where it's really interesting i was always a, a weird monkey um what i now call strategic alchemist so we created custom investable indices that ran by rules once they were done there was no human trading it wasn't like an alpha trading desk so like the nft once you get the dow set it all carries on i've been involved in what you call nfts for quite a while but more strategically and ironically it goes back to our thing that wasn't on the recording about do people keep their word we have a joking thing called the integrity police right and the biggest thing that goes back to 20,000 years ago is can you trust somebody to keep their word and do whatever it takes? But appropriately, well, we're human, right? We all make mistakes. The other weird thing is in Asia and other indigenous cultures, it was always the women who were the primary wisdom keepers back a long time, you know, Queen Cleopatra. And then something happened and it's re you said it really cleanly. People, not just women, we're all human. We create these limiting beliefs in our own glass ceilings. So it's a fascinating time. And Rachel, I, I love that you're witnessing this live. You know, you're going to make it up. Um, yes, yeah, so the whole conversation about abundance and thrivability, and we're going to go forward, but you get a sense, Lee, and even myself, I nearly died twice in the last two years. I actually um, collapsed the paraplegic migraine, and the first person I rang was Rachel, and because she was her, I did what you might think of some Ho'oponopono stuff, and I'm still here, but I nearly wasn't. Wow. So this sort of drive to make the difference, not a difference, is it's not new. Anyway, let's pause, start, reset. So over the years, Lee, of the three, pausing, stopping, resetting, which has been the hardest for you and why do you think that was? Actually, I love resets. I actually absolutely love resets. I think it's one of the most humane things we could do for each other. Say, hey, wait a second, let's let's do a reset and start over or let's do a reset and go in this direction. I think it's great for kids. I think it's great for um, me personally, for my relationship with my husband. Hey, let's do a reset and start over. I think that is a real gift. So that's always good for me. Whenever I see a reset, it just shows me I have the opportunity to do even better. And then the pause that sometimes can be tough for me because I am such a go, go energizer bunny. I just want to go, 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 go. But I'll tell you recently, I've been doing pause a lot more. Um, I've been having nights one or two nights a week. I'll sleep nine or 10 hours and just, I'll tell everyone, just let me off the grid and sleep as long as possible. And it's taking a pause and not just getting up and running around. And, and that's been really nice. And the stop, I actually recently had some stops, even having to let some team members go um, and just saying, this isn't working. It's not a pause or a reset. It's a clear stop. And um, it's emotional for me sometimes that when I'm in the motion of something or somebody else is included or their life might change in a way that is not the way they expected. Sometimes that can be really, really hard. So I'd say the stops are the hardest. Um, I just went through three of them in August where, where we're going in Web3. I've been teaching them for a long time and they're not getting it, but I don't want to have people that I'm dragging along. I want people that are excited about it. So I have to make room for that. And so I was clear with where we were going and I just told them it was time to find them a better match for the future, but they'll be on the sidelines watching and, and part of things along the way, we'll see what happens. So it's not even a complete stop. It's a stop with, for just this moment sometimes. By the way, that's exactly the whole point. The biggest thing about a stop is momentum stops. And then you can start to, re you can go, go again, right? But it's like the bowling ball going in the alleyway. When you stop it, the momentum's taken out of it. The charge is taken out. And so often people never actually stop. And ironically, yesterday, two people, first time ever, failed to complete the event and literally walked off, want refund, missed the entire point. <laughs> and Lafayette's like, I'm not really getting it. Four hours later, others are having these giant breaks. This is amazing. Missing, like they just missed the whole point of the show, you know, miss what's going on. And the same with like Rachel's been our business. There's a client who sort of was stopping. And the irony is it's, it's an upgrade process sometimes and nothing's wrong. What I love about how you're sharing and hopefully you can hear, and I, I hear it, Lee, there isn't like anger when you're talking about what you're talking about. You're just doing what's right for you and being real. And people aren't used to the real. Is that your experience? 
It can be. I think what it is, is you're right. Like because of having a near death experience and every day being so special, I'm also looking into my future. Like what, what legacy am I leaving? What, what impact am I making? And sometimes when I look there, I'm seeing the momentum's either. Yes, it's full on going in the right direction, or it is time for how can we do even better? And I don't look at it like we're doing something wrong because we're always learning. We're always connecting. We're always building something of value. Um, But sometimes it's like, wait a second, where can I spend my time where it could be even more useful or more impactful? And and that's the big piece. And that's sometimes when we do have to uh, look at the momentum of something and say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, I love doing this. It's a 10. On a scale of one to 10, this is a five. Maybe I eliminate the five so I have more room for the 10. And that I do on a regular basis, I guess, basically... I want to say monthly, but it's, it's running through my head all the time. I just make firm decisions monthly because those are payroll payroll cycles. And um, and I'm also looking for the best investment of our time and energy uh, with team. Love it. And by the way, if you're listening, this is Lee Richter. We'll show you how to get hold of it. GoAskLee.com is probably the best site for you, Lee. Is that right? GoAskLee.com, L-E-E. You got it. Go ask Lee.com. Lee Richter wasn't available the time I wanted to buy my URL like 12 years wow. ago. Okay. And I was communities where everyone was saying, go ask Lee, go ask Lee. And then they're like, you should name that your brand. And we did for fun in the beginning, but it's just stuck and it's fun and people remember it. And we've been able to build on it and people and I, you know, we get to laugh about it too, because it is true. Yeah. People ask a lot of questions. Yeah, I gave somebody the card yesterday and they're like, there's no details on it. It's like, it's got my name. Once you know my name, I'm the easiest person to get hold of. <laughs> like, you can't not find me. Like, um, and I'm completely with you. We have one called Just Ask Simon. Unfortunately, I get people asking me questions. That doesn't mean they want to pay me. <laughs> so it's like, ask Simon. And I often go, ask Lee. <laughs> go ask Lee. <laughs> Somebody asked me on the airplane um, for my business card. I'm like, I'm in Web3. I don't need to carry business cards anymore. Yeah, no, I get it completely. I've got one thing we wouldn't normally do, but just because I, I get a sense of useful. One of the things I found coaching, working entrepreneurs, I've been doing it like over two decades um, and you've you know massively done that stuff. You and I know on that entrepreneur's adventure, on the entrepreneur's journey, there's going to be a day where like, there's a big loss, right? It's predictable. Shouldn't be, but things happen. Like yesterday's example, uh, we had a beach house in Gambia, a war opened up in Gambia. Like you can predict it, but you can't sometimes, right? Um, right. And what I've been struggling, it's been the biggest bit on that journey from like self-employed, never earning more than, I don't know, 50K a year to having their first 100K breakthrough, the first million dollars, whatever that is. And also the impact switch, right? That legacy impact. Mm-hmm. I can't always help them pull, stop, reset on the bad days. You know what I mean? Like, I've just lost everything. Like, ah. What would be your top tip, like for them in those moments, like those dark night of the souls, the entrepreneur, when you want to like keep going, but some, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you- well, I've done it. You can do it again. That's the beauty of it. I mean, when we're watching some of the entrepreneurs out there, even on these TV shows where they take them back to zero and they have to figure it out, they can figure it out. They're taking billionaires and saying, go figure out how to make money. They can do it. If you've done it before, just do it again. If you haven't learned how to do it the proper way, find someone who does and model that. Look at people that are writing books about their wealth journey or wealth dynamics or whatever it is they're teaching about being able to have a relationship with money in a successful way. Because guess what? It is a relationship. It is an energy. And the more we pay attention to, hey, I should say nice things to my money and I should ask it to serve me and multiply, go out in the world and multiply and come back to me, right? Make good in the world. When I pay a check, I say that to my money. I say, thank you for serving me. Go out to the world. Now come back to me multiplied. And I give it a purpose because I learned back in the eighties with my Merrill Lynch education, what I learned is we all have a relationship with money and it is an energy. And I've noticed through life when I work with holistic doctors, a lot of them will say, oh, I'm not in it for the money. And then they stay poor and they can't help as many people. And I tell them, why don't you say, I'm in it for being paid the right amount so I can continue doing great in the world. It's the same equation, but make sure that you're telling your money you want it to come to you and stay with you instead of giving a pathway for it to go somewhere else where it's wanted. And Do we have to understand it? No, but we do understand all energy is energy and it doesn't go away. It changes in different forms. It's been proven. And if that's the case, make the energy go in your favor towards a positive legacy. Why not do that? And so the more I practice that, the more it shows up. 
I mean, I practiced that with fun things. Like I bought my husband a 1962 MG convertible and it was $13,000 at the time. It was his 40th birthday and I paid cash for it. And I said, thank you for serving me. Go out in the world and come back to me multiplied. And I kid you not, two days later, I got a check for $56,000 for something that I didn't even anticipate at that moment. So I looked at my assistant, I'm like, did you just see that happen? I mean, we just have been playing with this so long, but that was just a real exclamation point that if you believe it, you can make it come true. It's all in your head, that glass ceilings in your head, that it, a relationship with your parents is in your head. You get to determine how it's going to be here in the future. That relationship with your dog is in your head, how you show up. If you show up with matching energy with your dog, they will match your energy. Try it all day long. You ignore them, they'll, they'll go away. You interact with them and love them. They will play and play and give you that energy. They will match your energy. Money does the same thing. And so the more that we can open that relationship for good, the more that we can multiply it. Again, this is why we love Lee. <laughs> this is why when you get a Lee, let her talk because she's awesome and listen. And uh, you can listen back to this replay again and again and again and share it if you want. Um, I'm not being glibly, I mean it. Honestly, you get it, right? And you get that if you're listening to Lee, she's been living, it's not preaching, speeching it, teaching it. One of the challenges, by the way, that we're struggling with, I think, is that it's really hard to tell me outside what's actually going on in between you, little Winkley. I've been the last two decades, maybe the last decade, authenticating the, let's call it, uh, personal development industry, like as a strategic auditor that they don't know I'm doing for them. Does that make sense? So privately, a little side conversation we can have about real and not real and how to actually help them navigate that process um, in time. Um, so I'm excited. You know, I'm excited, Lee, because I get that you get it. And I have a sense that this question might open something up. And this is, what's the most important lesson you wish you could have given your younger self and why? Yeah, not really to care about what other people think. You know, I remember somebody telling me a long time ago, you know, don't really worry about what other people think. But I remember in high school I did. And I remember a few things I didn't do or did, could have done better because I was worried about what other people thought. Or I watched my daughter and she's 100 percent expressive of herself in so many ways, especially with me, with what she wants and what she doesn't want. And sometimes she says, this might hurt your feelings. However, this is what I'd like to do. And I'm like, wait a second, that doesn't hurt my feelings at all. That makes me proud that you're doing what you want to do. And at the same time, I will adjust because you're choosing your life, right? Well, I think I wish I knew those same lessons when I was her age. And when she was five years old, we started doing uh, some everyday affirmations together. And two of them are the first thing in the morning we say, today's the happiest day and I love my life. Today's the happiest day and I love my life. And I think, wow, if I was five years old and I did that every day of my life, which you and I even did that today and she's in Boston and I'm in San Francisco. But if I did that every day of my life, how would it have gone differently? But it's the learning lesson now that I know that that part of it is me starting my mindset in the morning with that reset of that feeling of today's the happiest day and I love my life because it starts me on an up upward spiral and the momentum's going in a way that I can build on in a positive way. And that I taught her that and she already has it, um, really shows me at the age of 18, how it's a tool for her. her. It's a reset for her each morning. It helps her get started and go do the things she has to do. I mean, she has calculus at 8 a.m. in Boston. She's not really thrilled about that, but every day she was there, she was on time. Part of it is because she's given herself the tool, like I can get through this, it'll be fine. And, you know, she can look forward to a nice breakfast with her friends after or a little freedom after for her next class. So she's looking forward to that. Even while she's in class, she's like, oh, well, I have something good to look forward to. And so I've trained her brain to look for that good instead of wake up. I'm so tired. I don't want to do this. I hate it. Now, I will tell you, she did try to drop that class and move it. And they're like, sorry, because you have this class, you can't move it. And she had to accept that. So I also saw her be resilient and not get her way in a class that we're paying a lot of money for. But, you know, she's like, OK, this is what I have to do now. So now, you know, she knows it's going to be a tough journey and she's looking for support. But instead of just giving up or complaining or blaming, she's looking for solutions. She asked my husband for some support this semester. She's like, I can't understand his accent, so I might have to record it and go over it. And instead of just giving up, being resilient, I think, is is the biggest key from that. Love it. One of my mentors, and I'm flashing back, I was about, it's about 30. And um, let's just say, just got be redundant from the bank. My then partner was pregnant. It was one of those, like, not a good moment things, right? Like, whoa, came across this guy. 
And um, one of his things was find a way, make a way, be shown away. And it's kind mm-hmm. of this thing about not burn your bridges. It's it, it's a really interesting thing. And I'm, part of what we've been bridging is the advanced training methods from like the special forces people and bringing that to entrepreneurship, that quality of integrity. And, and like your daughter gets it. I want that goal. That's how I get there. Got it. How do I read? And it isn't just like, NL, I'm an NLP guy, but like, don't just reframe it. It's like living it and just be really acknowledging her. And it's not here live. Partly why we're talking was I watched how she was showing up with you when you were in Maui and climbing, I can't say it right, Haleakala. And there was that, and it was, there's a realness to that. There was like a, a, and it is that. And I think that's what's magic fighting today is these, the daughters of women like you that crack the whole spell through. I feel like she is my guide. I learned so much because of her. I learned more about me, not only as a mother, but as a woman and as a human being, because I'm in tune to what, how sensitive she is and what she's thinking about and what her generation's thinking about. And it's, it's a really tough time for this generation. There's just so many choices and, you know, them going through the pandemic and being separated at a time where they needed each other the most. That, that, that human connection in high school is unforgettable in a lot of ways. But for some kids, like she was playing sports and she had her group of friends, like being removed from them was dramatic for them. And, and just seeing how resilient that, that they were and they did get a senior prom and they celebrated and supported it and appreciated it so much because it was the only one they got. And the year before they felt like they were missing out, but they, they still were, hurt through this, but also they're emerging stronger. They learn coping skills. Dan Sullivan, one of the things he mentioned to us was the last time the globe had to learn coping skills together was during the 1940s. And basically it skipped generations. And so what has happened is we got a little, you know, lax. We don't carry our luggage anymore. We roll it. Like everything is so much easier for us, right? We could access thing, everything on the computer. We don't even have to go to the library and pay to copy it anymore. Everything's just so automatic. And so we got a little lazy and a little soft. And here this made us have to learn coping skills. And this next generation, they witnessed their parents not having coping skills and learned how to do it for themselves and maybe even taught their parents along the way. Some parents have it. Now, I went through that near fatal car accident and I could see how I had established some coping skills that others didn't. And trust me, they came in handy a lot. But also, it also was hard for me to see other people who didn't have it and see them melt away and give up and feel like they were victims. What my biggest thing is in my team was showing them the opposite. How could we be strong? How come we look for one of the things we did the first week of COVID was we wrote 25 things that are going to be different and how we can make it better. And the team wrote it. I I wasn't even in the room. My manager did it with the team. And it was extraordinary the things they came up with. Now, the whole next year, our entire office was open. Not one single team member got COVID. Everything for a year was like unbelievably smooth as sailing during a time where you would think it would be so hard. But what we have at that business is um, a veterinary hospital. And we learned the clients could drop off the pets. We'd bring them in and serve them. But we just wouldn't let the clients come in. They had to go outside to the car and zoom us in. It was a new way of doing the transaction, but at the same time, it kept my team safe and they were thriving because instead of being non-essential, they were actually essential. And what I saw was that fed their brain, like, wow, I'm needed. Wow. I still have connections. And they started getting very grateful because they saw the difference between them and other friends that lost jobs couldn't work anymore, whatever victim mindset their friends were going through, they could feel the difference. And the difference was their own mindset, which is they were essential. They learned their coping skills. We turned a bad situation into a good one immediately. So no one wallowed in and thought about what they were sad about. Instead, what we were looking forward to was the new experience we were creating. But they let me know that that saved them, a lot of them through this whole pandemic is they had each other to look forward to. That connection was so important. And that's how I see like this next generation, when they were separated, when little kids couldn't see other kids, that is going to have an impact on us. So how can we make it easier for them? We have to really pay attention. I think Web3 is a a place that we can create those meaningful connections and and thrive again. Um, Whether there's a pandemic or not, we're now creating a new reality that a lot can be online doesn't have to be in person, but can feel like it's in person in some ways. Love it. One of the things that we look at is this ecosystem way of thinking. And I can really hear that with you. You built that for them. I know we've got a 
a hard stop with you actually actively developing projects in a while. So I'm going to pause the reset to the next question. I don't really want to. I want to do this for hours and hopefully one day live. As part of my gift, by the way, for myself is I got to meet you live, which means we can do this having met once. It's a whole different thing. It's a whole different experience having met somebody. So one of the things that helped me massively, my being going through weird pause stop resets for years, especially over COVID, was books and movies. And I'm just curious what books and movies have most changed your life or helped you go through your poor stop resets. Like one where I'm a warrior. It's, a, it's amazing because even the room I'm in right now, I'm surrounded by a thousand books. However, I will say right before the pandemic in February um, and in March of 2020, right before it was announced in America in March, um, Oprah Winfrey was here in America and I got to see her and go backstage at two different venues. And one was in Brooklyn. And that was in February and then early, early March um, or even late February. I was it was in San Francisco. And when I was there, she handed me and signed uh, three books. I was backstage with her and I read all three of them. And they normally wouldn't be books that I would say, but because they were her words, because she gave them to me directly there. It's almost like our version of what the queen would tell people. It's very yeah. interesting. A U.S. version. Right. So the first one is called What I Know for Sure which I think is beautiful because it, she's met so many leaders, so many people. She spent time with the queen. She's all of us have watched her interact with these global leaders, with our presidents. And then she writes what I know for sure. And she gives some really nice life lessons. And then she also gave me two other books, the wisdom of Sundays and the Path made clear. And those three together, you know, she gave them to me in Brooklyn. And by the time I saw her in San Francisco, I had already read them. And I was able to interact with her and, and talk to her a little bit about a couple of the stories. And what I saw is that she really wants to impact for good and give people an opportunity to learn from her learning lessons, but also from her unique advantage perspective because of these connections. And so I like reading them because they're just real stories from real people. It's not just thinking of this is a president and this is Oprah, but these are just two people having a conversation and how they're sharing it with us. And, and I think that's really important. It's just like you and I right now, we didn't go on script like normal. We're just having a conversation because that's more our style together. And it's fun because then we just get to, you know, let it flow outside. It's not predicted. It's not prescripted. It's not, you know, written ahead of time. It's just, you know, how we feel right now in this moment. And I think that's our best impact is we can have other people just shift a mindset 1% either more positive or more abundant or just more in their right best future self, um, then that's something that's, it's worthwhile. But for me, I'm always working towards how can be, I be my best future self and those books from Oprah, what I know for sure, the wisdom of Sundays and the path made clear. Some of those gave me ideas on how to be a better future self. And, and that's why I like them. I love it. I've not come across those yet. That's one of the love about conversations like this. I did love, and I really want to underline that, it's learning from other people's learning lessons and their unique perspectives, especially when they're real. And as you know, it's, it's interesting how like, while Oprah isn't a like a queen of a physical nation, she has been a queen of a nation, you know, own for years, right? It's a whole thing and helped like other people. Right? Yeah. Unlike the chosen one. And that's the thing that's so magical about it. In her mind though, she always saw herself like this. Like, uh, you know, someone reminded me of a story that, she said a long time ago, which was when her grandmother was talking to her when she was little, she said, when you're lucky, you'll be able to grow up and work for a white family. And she goes, mom, grandma, mm -hmm. a white family is going to be working for me. <laughs> like I wouldn't even, she wouldn't even think about it or consider that that was her path. She knew her path was a, a much greater substance and that she couldn't let her grandmother's limiting beliefs go into her head. She had to change it immediately so that if she didn't take that into the future, that was somebody else's limiting belief. And it definitely was not hers. I'm going to confess something. I was walking around Canary Wolf with my, my father, my stepfather, my father, um, Bill and my mom. And um, we were talking about how, you know, you know, financial goals that people have. Right. And we're talking about having the goal of making, you know, 10 K a month, hundred K a month. And in his reality, that wasn't possible. Now, you and I have like, what? Because you and I know people that made a million pounds in an hour on stage, either a performer or somebody with an animation product or an NFT. It's a whole different world. And it is, it's, it's mind boggling about how we get not impacted by the people, but you sort of take that stuff on. And I, I hadn't heard that, ironically. Um, I've had friends that have worked with Oprah, helped produce her show, but never come across that thing you just shared. And that explains a lot in a way that's really relevant for the time we're in. 
Um, I always believe, you know, we're all human. I've been saying I'm humanese for quite some time and it gets confusing, but like we're all good people, right? Just be good. Um, you did, and I think probably, you know, the event experience that most caused you to have that pull start reset moment. Um, what helped you through it? Because I know for me, like without Rachel, without my mum, without friends and partners, I wouldn't be here. I'm just curious, like what, what got you through? That's a really good question. I'll say I went inside. I never once saw me dying. Like even when the accident first happened, um, my femur was broken in so many severe places. It was more than 15 places. It was shattered and people die for that. And I remember someone saying to me, lady died, died for less. It was actually one of the police officers that, that found me in the accident told me a month later, just so you know, lady died, died for less. Like you overcame something that seems impossible. They, they didn't think I was going to last 24 hours. And there was something inside me. I never saw me dying. I had a premonition about the car accident two weeks before I mentioned it to a friend. I said, I was afraid of a bad driver right now. And it never happened before or since, but I had that premonition. Um, a lot that got me through it was me believing it was my choice that I had to go through and learn this for some reason. I, I took control and ownership of it. And I was mad at the guy who hit me for a long time because he never apologized and he literally almost killed me um, and changed everything. Um, and then I looked for the gifts. Like one of my gifts is actually we adopted our daughter, Abby, because in the car accident, I had broken my back and where my back was broken, they said, you could be, you could be paralyzed in a wheelchair forever if you get pregnant. So one of the things we did was we went through the adoption system and we got Abby the day she was born. And from day one, I always call her my gift from the accident. If I didn't go through the accident, I might not have been matched to her, but it's one of the best matches made on earth that I could ever imagine for myself is being connected to her. It makes me want to cry. So, um, that's okay. We're human. And by the way, thank you for sharing that. Cause like often the bit that it, it's, that's the stuff that's so miraculous and it's so challenging. And, you know, people that know me well, you couldn't make it up some days. It's like, and it, when it opens up and it's beautiful, it's amazing. In that dark night of the soul, you're like, where's this going? But you said it so clearly, what's the lesson? What am I putting myself through this for? Now, this isn't about faith and belief, but it kind of is, but it isn't. And it's not about believing what I'm telling you or at least telling you, but it's finding that own knowing, that truth. And I love that, again, that book you mentioned earlier, what I know for sure, I'm a big believer in that. Um, and I'm just for fun, where you sort of reset what you need to. Everybody's going out, they're going, practice makes perfect. It doesn't. And there's something about when you know that, like, I know that I've met you. I know that you're awesome. <laughs> I don't think you're awesome. I know you're awesome. It makes life easier, <laughs> right? Um, versus this whole wishy-washy stuff. And um, I, I know you're good to go. And Abby, thank you for the miracle because without you, we be having this show, you know. And You, know um, you have to choose your path because that's what's in your head. So you only have to convince yourself. You don't ever have to convince anyone else, ever. It's only you in your own head. And the more you practice, the, it never makes perfect, but the more it makes better. And it can make it towards your best future self. And that's what I'm always thinking when I'm writing vision boards, when I'm thinking stuff, I'm like, is this taking me to my best future self? And then I actually had a conversation with some, a whole bunch of young 20 year old guys a couple of weeks ago in Austin, Texas, we were at a copywriter symposium and I was actually speaking about NFTs to the copywriters and all of them, you know, I'm like, really, it comes down to two things. If what I'm doing is taking me closer to love. And just knowing I'm on this planet to love and be loved. It just comes back to that basic thing. This is why dogs can make us so happy is because they give us unconditional love. No matter when we see them, they're so happy to see us, right? And that unconditional love triggers something, you know, really happy inside of us. So just go there. Is this taking me closer to love? And all I'm here for is to love and be loved. And really, even through these transactions, a lot of that is like just sharing more love. This is why I love doing stuff in the pet industry, because I know people adopt pets because they want more love in their life and they want to be connected and they want to do good. And I just want to help them do it even better. And I want to show up and be a champion for them so they can be a champion for their pet. And that's, you know, makes it really fun transaction for me. That's one of the things I talk about in marketing is when you're doing marketing, if it's, your, if it's something you're really passionate about, it's not even marketing, it's just sharing. It's, it's actually saying, hey, wait, this is something to pay attention to because it could help you be even better. Again, wow. <laughs> Sorry. It's like what, one of the things in me, and I know Rachel, you already think similar. We don't have people like you over here in the UK, Lee. Honestly, we don't. We used to I mean, maybe, but we don't. We at all. Go ahead. Next time you have a conference and uh, actually uh, I was just invited to speak at the NFT conference coming to London in 
I think it's the end of November. Um, I'm trying to see if I could work it in my schedule because I spoke at the NFT NYC conference the last two years. And so they're doing the first NFT London one and they did invite me. I just have to see if it coordinates, but I want excuses to get over there. I absolutely love it. I love staying there. I love the whole environment, the history, the people. It's just extraordinary. I I'm happy to share. I, I've had some friends in other countries that have said the same thing. Like we need some more of this mindset. The thing is here, it feels like it's in my world. It feels like it's everywhere, I guess, because I resonate that. So I see it the most, but yeah. I'm in Berkeley and I'm in in San Francisco. And a lot of my friends, this is just how we behave and think and come together and reinforce it with each other, I guess. And, and What's the point of complaining and being a victim? It doesn't take you to closer to love. It doesn't take you closer to happiness. So how do you train your brain to do the reverse, right? How do you how do you talk about what you don't want and then convert it to what you do want? And that's really the key to all of us is anytime you say something you don't want, immediately convert it to what you do want. Like if you don't want to be late, then you say, I want to be on time. It's really the same thing. It's just focusing on what you do want so you get closer okay. to that best future self. So you're making a pathway that's more fun, more, you know, easy and a reason to get up in the morning. Yeah. We, we talk about focus on B like, and there's a thing about focus and prioritization. Most people can't focus more than about a millisecond. They think they can, but they really don't. And they don't have that strong, this is what I'm going for. Rachel, I have a project that you're already living into Lee called Imagine Your Eden. It's like, what do you really want? I don't really think about it. I also think part of it and like this is like a weird thing to talk about in the energy conversation. You and I know there's unethical marketers. So there's a, one of the challenges is people have been burned. And once you get burned, it's hard to go back to that pure love space, right? Any tips on that or anything you want to share about that sort of space? Because it's even NFTs, right? I got burnt by some rug pulls. There is some amazing stuff and there's a lot of mischief out there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, first of all, you use my favorite word, which is imagine. I love that. Imagine like that's that's an opening to so much. So you said in this too, like imagine creating um, an NFT portfolio that actually is profitable, like you get to create it. And I don't actually look at NFTs as a lot of people do, which are investments. I actually look at them as tickets and access. So when I'm buying NFTs, I'm buying it for the smart contract and what I get behind it, access to a community, access to an event, access to exclusive uh, VIP experience, whatever it is. Um, I mean, just yesterday they announced um, one in the football world um, where you know people are gonna get access to, you know, different players and different things. And, and just being able to see like people coming in it for that, I think is fun. But I do think the number one thing at the front of everything is, can you trust the people you're working with? If you hire a team to make a, a funnel for you, you want to talk to other people they've worked with, make sure you see the statistics, everything in internet marketing has a dashboard and it has statistics of what's their open rate, their click-through rate, what's their advertising fees. You can get that kind of results um, from them and ask them for the statistics from other clients. And you can look at their campaigns online because they're all online and just find people you trust. Now, a lot of times I've tried to hire people internally to do some of this for that reason, because I feel like I can trust them more. But sometimes the experts who just do it all the time, like a surgeon who does that surgery all the time, sometimes it's a lot better to shorten our learning curve and hire them in the beginning to at least get set up and, and learn the right questions to ask and right key performance indicators to watch. Um, so sometimes it's trial and error. Um, but the first thing is, can you trust this person? And that's going to be the same thing in the NFT space. This is what I love about um, the affiliate DAO that we put together is all 75 mentors have been credentialed and we know we can trust them. I'm one of them. And what I love is we have access to one another to run by ideas. Like if I want to hire a company, I can say, has anyone used this company? What are your results? I actually did that yesterday. Um, I found some software and I ran it by three of the people in the, the Web3 world and said, what do you think of this? Two of them are like, oh, I can make that in a minute. And the other one is like, I use it and it works well. But the two that can make it in a minute, I think that's funny because I'm like, oh, well, maybe I should just make my own because I didn't even think I could. But if it's that simple, I can make it an internal offering. So those two people actually expanded my learning just by asking them if I could do it. They imagined it like not only could you do it, but you could do it for yourself. And so they took it one step further. So I think having the right people on your team and access to those people you trust um, can take it to a, another level. 
A hundred percent. And you and I, I think it's time to talk about inner circle society offline, but you get it. And by this is how it's been for lots of time. People often, there's doors closing without them realizing because they're coming from that wrong energy. They're coming from, how can I grab it? How can I steal it? It would be like Abby trying to steal a banana from your kitchen. It doesn't make any sense, right? She wouldn't do that because it's our kitchen. But there's such a fear and scarcity out there in worlds don't need it to be. And I know you've been out to my favorite place, Maui, much more than I have. There's a whole thing. Gonna- that- week, actually. Oh, well, my dreams to go back and actually take Rachel out there and others and maybe one day do um, a project around the sort of, I have some plans. We always have plans, but love it. It's also often very hard by the way to authenticate people if you don't know how to authenticate them. Does that make sense? Um, you'll love this one. Well, that's going to be great with the NFT world too, is one of the things we're going to be offering is a validation in our community that we did our due diligence. We know this person, we trust this person. I'm doing that for other clients too. JJ Virgin wants to do that inside of her Mindshare community. She's like, one of the things I want to do is credential my people to know who they can trust and work with so that they're not just, you know, working with anyone and getting taken advantage of. Just like you said, some people get burned, they learn them the hard way. And you're not only learning, you're not only losing money that you're losing energy and momentum. And so you want to make sure you have that right trust factor in place in the beginning. Yeah, love to talk about that offline. Actually, we were, had an idea on the back of yesterday's meeting about that. And also, it's really interesting. So like somebody that I can trust, you might not be to trust, but that's, that's weird, right? It's like, it's very um, situational. They're strategic and they're situational depending on how you do agreements and how you work. And and at the same time, ideally, we're all on the same team and you have the same mindset and values and it gets easier and easier. Like you mentioned Dan Sullivan, Dan Sullivan, strategic coach, amazing guy. I never met him, but I know people that like vouch for him at a massive high level. You clearly know Dan really well, right? Personally? Oh, yeah. I'm in his, his highest level mastermind and people that are in there are like Gino Wickman, who wrote um, Traction, who's one of my favorites. And then Dean Jackson, who wrote um, the nine word Dean's email. And like Dean's a man. And Joe Polish is in there. So we're all students together in there. And we grow together and we learn from one another. We pull the curtain back on this is what's not working. I need help. And this is what's working. How do I amplify it or multiply it? Or one of the things, because we trust each other so much in that group and we have a commitment to be together for 25 years. And a lot of them have been in strategic coach more than 20 years, but in our mastermind group, which is basically, uh, it was called game changer. It's now called free zone frontier. And what that means is we're creating things that don't exist yet, but how do we collaborate together because we trust each other so much. So when I'm looking to collaborate, that's my first place I go is in that room because I trust them hundred percent. I know them. We're committed to each other. We will not let each other down. We will be on time. We will be on budget and we'll add more value because of our capabilities being different. So that's one of the things we've learned how to really identify our capabilities and then identify where we need to fill in gaps. And then if there's people in the group that can fill the gap, that's the first one we go to. 100%. And my magic word there, commitment, when you commit, the magic happens in a ways you can't always bridge on the outside. Um, I committed 20 years ago plus to being a Tai Chi Chi teacher, Tai Chi master. It's 24 years. I'm learning more in the last two weeks than the last 20 years. And um, did it, but now you're at the highest level where the learning is so rich and only a only a few handful of people learn at that level. How many people are committed to it to get to that level? It's it's a real separation of people at, at that level. Yeah. And the sort of leaping back to earlier thing about Her Majesty and the Queen, there are people that have literally spent 50 years walking with her, right? They've literally lied, lied their lives down for her. They invested their lives. I'm not going to do the story justice. Do you know, I'm sure you know the story about the three stonemasons building a cathedral. You know that story? I don't think I, if I do, I'd rather hear it from you. I'll do the very quick version. Imagine, you know, Queen Lee walks around the cathedral and you see three stonemasons like physically building a cathedral, like in London, St. Paul's. One is like miserable, swearing, cursing, angry, upset, pissed off. We can all, it's all out still, but like, no, they're upset. He's not happy. Like what's going on? I hate my job and belly scraping by. I hate, I hate this. The other one, he's sort of okay. He's not happy, but he's all right. And it's like, well, how come you're okay? It's like, well, I pay my bills. I've got a great friend and, you know, I have a life and I can survive and it's okay. The next one is like beaming happy. Like, what's up with him? What is he taking? What's going on? That's just weird. And he's like, I'm building a cathedral for God. His context was completely different. Same work, same activity, different experience. Exactly. 
And it's his mindset when he got up that morning that he was doing something that was valuable and adding to the world. 100%. So we're wrapping up time shortly, but not forever. Again, Lee is easy to get hold of, but like, honestly, Lee, this is beyond what I expected. And it's good stuff. Like, I don't mean that like lightly. It's like... And questions next time, I promise. <laughs> well, we've actually covered a few of them. Um, some of the people listening to this show, they're either going to be trying to make a shift of what's possible for their lives. Sometimes, as you and I know, it's because like it isn't working and they want to reset. And sometimes like that great TV uh, advert with Kobe, unfortunately not with us, you know, success on success on success. They're doing great. They want it even better, right? This like, what the water's out there. What's your biggest suggestion, biggest tip for somebody who's like, you know what, I'm time, it's time for my reset, it's time for that shift. What would be your biggest tip for them? Well, Brene Brown, who's done over 4,000 interviews of people who are successful, has determined that there's two main variables that help the most successful. In other words, the people that are the most successful have these two things in common. And number one, they start in gratitude. Number one, every day start in gratitude. Um, my friend Lee Brower calls it starting big, be in gratitude, B I G B in gratitude. So every day I start up with, you know, today's the happiest day. I love my life, but then I go into what I'm grateful for. And that does shift my mindset. And I notice it because the days I don't do it are not always as full and beautiful quality, right? Different quality to them. That's really subtle. But when you know it, it's like, it's it's all oh, wait, let's go back to that. Let's be in gratitude right now. So number one, be in gratitude. And number two, be resilient. Do those steps every day. Be consistent, be resilient, keep going. Even if other people tell you you can't do it, it's not about them. And it's not that you have to rise above them. It's what you do is just be consistent and stick with your passion. Keep doing it. Keep going towards what you think is your dream, your inner vision, what you see and what you want, just keep being resilient and going towards it. Do not let other people slow you down or stop you or tell you it's wrong. Let those supporters show up to help support you. And that's where I am right now. I'm looking for those supporters and I'm making room for them to show up and going with them into the future. And it's so much easier that way. And I don't want to make it hard. I want to make it easy. So how do I create my mindset around it being easy, lucrative, and fun. As Joe Polish says, the elf way, easy, lucrative, and fun. And so, yeah, I think being focused on that, in gratitude, and being resilient is really the key. Lee, I think it's time to pause, start, reset. Is there anything else you want to share before we drop? No, I'm so glad we had this connection right now. I actually really loved our conversation and I learned from you and other people just like you because I'm open and curious. And I hope that some people got to learn from us today because they were open and curious too. Well, I know I did for sure. And um, if you know any other amazing guests that you'd love to have these sort of questions asked to, Lee, let us know if any popped to mind. Um, I'm, it, I'd love to do these things. And thing I've spent most of my life learning is learning how to ask different questions. You sort of pointed at it today. It's like, what am I grateful for? What I really want to cause? And that makes all the difference. And one of the biggest interesting challenges, um, Alex Mendozian, you might know, you know, Alex? I know him very well, as a matter of fact. Uh, we've even had trips to Vegas together to veterinary conferences. I brought him with me. So yeah, he's one of my favorite people on the planet, actually. I, I miss him. So when he came to London, he did an event called... Um, basically alexinlondon.com. And Mm -hmm. I was sort of helping doing what I weirdly do. I give him a card and he rang me up and we had a call and I went to see him. And his biggest tip was become a better receiver. And I'm still learning that one. Mm, That's true. That is definitely something also is being open to receiving. I've actually had to work on that. I remember at one point, it was like three months straight. I even listened to recordings around being open to receiving. And sometimes it might be a protective thing. Sometimes it's because we're over giving all different reasons, but yeah, being open to receiving is actually a skill. And um, a lot of people deflect uh, compliments that come to them. And that's your first clue that, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me stop and just say thank you and be open to receive that and actually ha- let it land. There's a reason why that person gave you that compliment. Let it land, receive it, be grateful. And uh, it'll ho- be a whole different experience. So I'm glad you brought that up. Being open to receiving is actually something that a lot of us have to work on. It's not just natural sometimes. 
And the other link to the sort of global leader, global conscious leader, global optimization, and sort of, again, giving you open receiving. How much do you know about Buckminster Fuller's work, Bucky Fuller? Oh my God, that's um, you know one of oh, that was to <laughs> Alex. So I hear about Bucky Fuller's work from Alex at, on occasion, and every single thing is extraordinary. Love it. And you haven't met Roy Williams yet? Roy. Oh yeah, I'm actually I've gone to um, Austin to the Wizard Academy with Alex four years in a row. I, I spoke there last year, and I'll be there. I believe I'm there this August, October as well. Um, I absolutely love it. It is, he is so brilliant. Yeah. Um, I'm, I read his book pendulum. I've recommended it. And people have already written back to me saying the book pendulum has changed the way they think about cycles and the earth and the planet. So, uh, really bright people too, who have thanked me for sharing that book pendulum, but Roy and his work around the brain and how the brain works and how to get people to take action. His, his work is brilliant. He, he wrote the wizard of ads. I don't know if you've read those books, but they're, I, I, they're I have them on my shelf when I went to path from the Alex many years ago. And he also wrote a book called particles of the brain, which is now mainly online website. And what you're sort of getting at this end of the, if you sort of stuck the recording, you start to get these wizard people. And he's like a magic word, similarly. And my biggest challenge Lee, is not everybody can physically go there, if that makes sense. Right. And it takes time to get to know Alex. And he's such a genius. And the impact Alex has made, it even lets this conversation happen. We couldn't have done this without Alex and Alex running the Knowledge London. And I wanted and still do that sort of share, what I call the knowledge now, right? It's all different and it's changing so fast. And it's possible for a young adopted child in the real world, time they're 18, to literally have a passive income making them 5, 10K easy from their 18 over 18 years. The tech's done, billions invested. And the only challenge now is having people the right mindset, the right heart, the right integrity and the collaboration. And the last thing I brought Alex actually up, then we will wrap up for today. Well, we may not, we'll just start another conversation. Is the challenge, mm -hmm. how do you collaborate when you've got awesome alpha leaders? Like, how do you have multiple queens and kings work together? And he said, like, years ago, Simon, it's never going to happen. You can't have the sort of, you can't herd cats when you can, but you can't, right? So the problem is everybody's being really busy on their path, but there's also this beauty when we can do these um, things together, if that makes sense, these sort of orchestral pieces that take everybody coming together, like call strategic alchemy, and missing much more than the whole. And you've done that today, Liv, masterfully, beautifully. And it's an absolute privilege. And what what can people do that are listening? Anything you want to say before we wrap up and go to the next stage? So I'm pretty sure sort of dumped a bit there or vented a little bit there. Well, I'm so grateful for you. I'm grateful that you create a space like this and, and that you could be one of the pioneers for a uh, better mindset for all of us. I love it. And that you have such a great partner. See, the two of you working together gets to multiply it and that you appreciate each other. And I love that you acknowledge genius and other people ahead of you, even like Alex Mendozian, you know, paying homage to him as uh, one of the first dominoes to help you do something new. But now looking at how impactful it is makes him so proud. He loves it when his students go off and do things even better than he could have done. You know, that's one of the things he celebrates. He loves stories like this where you take an idea and multiply it. So I can't wait to go back to him and tell well, him. I'll give you talk. another. He introduced me to a young man called Jesse. You know Jesse? Harv's son? That works for him? Jesse Ecker. Oh, Jesse Ecker, I didn't yes. realize who Jesse was for about a decade. <laughs> this, had, this is on her podcast recently. Jesse is awesome. And that's the kind of thing. Alex is this big-hearted super connector. That if you're not, you don't know Alex yet, check out Alex. Like, the problem is you can't... Uh, we could spend hours, but it is. I got, love that you get it. And any tips on partnerships while I've got you? Because that's the hardest thing I found is like as a solo player, I'm awesome. I'm like, let's go. When you start to have like a proper partner in life and business, it's a whole different game. It is. It is. The number one thing that Dan Sullivan taught us in our um, Game Changer Now Free Zone Frontier is, is, you know what your capability is and I know what mine is. When we bring it together, it should be adding value, but you still own 100% of what you create and I own 100% of what I create. We just create something even better together. So like he published books with Ben Hardy. Ben Hardy and him did the work together, but Ben owns the books and then Dan put in there, if they want to work with him, he gets the new clients. Well, it's worked out very well for Dan. He's gotten hundreds of new clients in his ecosystem that have opted in because they've done the work in the book. So they've, they're actually even more qualified clients. And both of them are happy. Both of them have stayed in their zone of genius and owned their zone 100%. So they don't have to worry about 
anything other than lifting each other up. There's no way to let each other's down. They already have done the work and now they get to reap the benefits that come from it, but each in their own zone of genius. And so that's what we're doing in the, in our group is like, what is your capability? What is mine? Yours might be a 10 X capability. Mine might be a 10 X capability, but by putting them both together, we now have a hundred X capability because we can multiply it. And so in my group, that's how I'm looking at things are what's your capability you can bring that's different than mine that we can add to mine and make it even better. And we can do it together and do it in a way that is easy, lucrative and fun, right? It has to go through that Joe polished, easy, lucrative and fun way, because otherwise, why are we doing it? 100%. Lee, you get the win-win-win game. You are a true catalyst. You tip the scale. Strategic alchemy partner. Thank you. Um, Obviously, people want to find out, I'm going to assume, I like to say no assumptions. If you want to learn more about you, engage with you, or do things that will benefit what you're up to in the world, what's the best way for them to do that apart from checking out goasklee.com? Yeah, goasklee.com is is our main place that a lot of our stuff is um, housed, including our NFTs, how to get in the NFT course and how to get started or how to sign up for NFT news. We do an NFT daily news. All of that is in my goasklee.com. We we love it that people can go there, see what's new, and we'll keep adding to it. When I'm speaking, we'll, we'll mention that. I'm going to the Emmys on Monday, so my team is writing up uh, stuff about like what who are people voting for at the Emmys so I can you know represent there yeah. and cheer them on. And uh, so, yeah, we, we pretty much put the updates all there so they can find me there. Thank you so much. And Lee, thank you to you. Thank you to your partner. Thank you to Abby. Thank you to your whole team, because honestly, this is breathtaking. And I know what you've been doing more than you realize, like the ripples you leave are, are tremendous. And you've impacted millions of lives, if not much more than that already. Um, so thank you so much, Lee, for being with us today for Poor Start Reset. I really do appreciate who you are and who you're being with on the show and the stand you are. I personally found most valuable the reminder of like just, you know, the Oprah stuff about, you know, what I know for sure and the path made clear. And more than that, just the, the gratitude, the clarity, and not being beaten down when other people don't get it, which I think is really easy to do as an entrepreneur when you're not fully understood, especially when you're ahead of the curve with marketing and business and ideas. And also, yeah. just go ahead, Trey. Well, thanks for noticing. Thanks for being a champion out there. Part of it is, is what we said earlier, if you're on the same frequency, you can see it. And because you are that, that's why you can see it in me. And I appreciate that. Always did from day one. Absolutely. <laughs> so look, um, if you've enjoyed the show, head to Apple Podcasts, make sure you subscribe, give us five stars, make a comment what you've heard and take action on that Lee has shared today because the action, as Lee said earlier, that makes all the difference. Uh, find more resources and information at pause.reset.com and Lee, the last word is yours. Imagine. Love it. Good night. Once again, I'm Simon Headley. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pause, Stop, Reset, which is brought to you by the team at simonx.com and published by thesimpleidea.com. So you get maximum value and to access all the bonuses and gifts, make sure to head to pause.reset.com, register and explore the portal. And if you're looking for great people, check out onesmartnetwork.com. If you've enjoyed the show, do give us a positive review, subscribe and share this episode with friends. I can't wait to share our next episode with you. Till then, remember, you can always choose to pause, stop, reset. Reset.